So this is another video on behavioral economics for nudge theory. So when we're looking at nudge theory, it's, it's important to look at the alternatives. And remember, if we're doing it from uh, the perspective of, for example, the government, uh, who are setting policies uh, regularly, and they're thinking of the best approach, especially in terms of um, getting public on board, um, we can look at more direct levels of intervention in terms of completely eliminating choice full stop and actually completely regulating it, banning it, whatever it might be. They could go to the other end of the spectrum where they simply do nothing and just completely allow it to the free market. Or in between, you get these different types of methods and um, it could be providing information, it could be enabling choice, it could be guiding choice. And that guiding choice through changing the default is where we get nudge theory. So nudge theory is uh, it's an intervention from the government, but it's much more subtle and it's not forcing it upon people, but it's directing people to make the right decisions. Now, within those uh, different types of, of, of methods of intervention um, where we saw nudges, we also, if we carried on going up, we may have seen shoves and we may have seen smacks as well. Now, what is meant by shoves and smacks, they are much more forceful and that's when obviously we're getting to the top of the intervention methods where the government might uh, again, for example, give financial disincentives such as tax on cigarettes. Uh, that would be a shove. It wouldn't be a nudge. Maybe providing information about the cigarettes in terms of how they might danger your health. That would be a nudge. But a shove would be the indirect tax on cigarettes in terms of um, t tobacco duty. Now, a smack, again, is at the very top of that spectrum in terms of eliminating choice. So that could be, for example, um, age restrictions. So um, you cannot buy um, cigarettes until the age of 18, let's say. Or in America, buying alcohol until the age of 21. That would be um, a completely eliminating that choice where people of that age can simply not buy it. Now, just a quick reminder again about nudge, and you may have seen this in the other videos, um, it's the whole reason of doing it is to steer people towards a particular behaviour by creating environmental conditions that trigger a given heuristic strategy. So that's absolutely crucial. And if you remember in uh, some of the other videos that you may have watched on the channel, uh, there's three main ways. So remember, it's based on three basic premises. Uh, again, people often make heuristic driven decisions and that cares about much conscious thought so these decisions sometimes are not in the maker's best interests and therefore nudge theory can be used to manipulate uh, people to make better decisions now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to show you a quick video on uh, richard h dealer where he's talking about how you can nudge them into the making the right decisions for them uh, so for example it could be uh, turning towards goods with positive externalities um maybe in terms of a healthy foods rather than buying uh, or, or taking up the option of demerit goods such as unhealthy foods <laughs> We never make choices in isolation. If we went downstairs to our cafeteria, there are several stations that you can get food. But as you walk in, the first thing you run into is a salad bar. And you have to walk around the salad bar to get to the burgers and fries. This is an example of how something that seemingly isn't very important may influence what people eat, nudge people to eat something healthy. And that's true in, in every domain. When we, when we go to the regular restaurant, the chef has decided what kinds of things he or she wants to cook, but somebody has the job of writing that all down. And there are lots of choices one could make and how to structure a menu. Uh, what are the categories? What order do things appear within the categories? Um, all of these things are going to influence choice. Now suppose we add number of calories as has been done in many fast food restaurants by law. If you discover that that cinnamon roll you were about to buy has a thousand calories, you might say, oh, well, maybe that banana looks good. 
One of the things we stress is the importance of default options. So we say since choice architecture is inevitable, there has to be a menu. There has to be a design of that cafeteria. Why not make it a good one? The first so-called nudge unit was formed by David Cameron in the UK, I think in 2010, and there were five people. There are now a couple hundred people working there and a couple hundred other such units around the world. And people say we're bossing people around, uh, which we're not. There's always opt-out in the policies we design. But the analogy we like is to GPS. I have the world's worst sense of direction. So wandering around in a strange city, I'm doomed. Now, think about GPS. The user chooses the destination, and the map helps you get there, and allows you to take a detour. If you're driving and you see a nice view, pull over, the GPS never yells at you, right? It's not a backseat driver. So um, imagine that we can have GPS for life that just made getting where you want to go easier without ever commanding that you must do something. That would be great. So with regards to nudges, uh, nudges can be done in many different ways. Um, they can be communicated in different ways. And it just, I suppose, it depends on the policymaker in terms of what they believe is the most effective way of influencing the decision maker. So you can have, for example, positive nudges, negative nudges, personal nudges. Not all of these nudges will work on influencing. And therefore, what you have to try to tackle is, okay, if I want to influence them to make the right decision, how do I do it? Would a positive nudge work? Would a negative nudge work? Or would a personal nudge work? So for example, uh, this is a scenario where they're trying to collect tax faster. Um, and what you might get is uh, maybe a letter through the door and it says um, a positive nudge. So 65% pays, you too, right? And it's, it's trying to get you to, I suppose, follow the head. It's trying to get you to say, well, why is the majority of people paying their tax on time, but you're not? Or it could be a negative nudge where it says 35% does not pay, make sure you do. And in that case, what you're looking at is you're wanting to stand out. I suppose it's playing on that moral compass and you're saying, well, actually, I don't want to be one of those uh, 35% that doesn't pay. Uh, and a personal nudge could be if you will pay, we can build a park near you. So in other words... Um, what benefits you and your local community and sometimes just depends on how it's communicated and how it's framed and I'll, I'll, I'll make a video based on framing soon uh, but it's looking at uh, what is the best way to influence those people or those decision makers so this was one example where they experimented with speeding tickets and what you had was the original um, pretty bland just speeding ticket where it gives you information of for example the um, the fine, um, the offence, and so on. But actually, then what they decided to do is decide to experiment and think, actually, would people pay their speeding ticket fines faster if there was more of a personal touch nudging them into doing so? So, for example, a photograph of actually the car in the speeding offence. And what they found was actually by including that image and make it much more personal for where they could actually see their car in the image and uh, what they were doing, obviously speeding, it actually meant that people were willing uh, and people just did voluntarily pay faster in terms of their, uh, their speeding offence. Now, uh, another nudge that many governments do and many local councils do is to do with speed radars because obviously they cannot, they haven't got the resources to... Um, to pretty much manage speed in all areas of a, of a city, for example. So what they've done is speed radars to, to again, act as a nudge to just kind of bring it, your attention to the speed that you're doing and to try to correct it yourself. So I'm just going to show you a quick video based on that now.
to uh, these types of methods again uh, for behavioral economists. Um, what some students sometimes do as a mistake is get mixed up between shoves and nudges. So what I used to do is just go through an example of a shove. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a video of a scenario. I was mentioning unhealthy foods earlier, so I'm going to look at why maybe a shove might be needed more so than a nudge. Healthy, but where fast food's so easy to get your hands on, it's like you just fall straight back into eating it again. We can order it to school, like yeah. we can order like pizza or something. To have it start early, and so you can't just suddenly change it up halfway through someone's life. In a report today, teenagers are calling for takeaway foods to come with health warnings. A quarter admit they've ordered a takeaway to their school. More than a third say there are places selling unhealthy food less than two minutes' walk from their school. And almost one in three have gone to a fast food takeaway specifically because it offers free Wi-Fi. We'd like clearer food labelling uh, for kids, warning the dangers, the health warnings of obesity. Uh, we'd like retailers to make the healthy choice the easier choice. Experts say the government needs to listen to young voices as part of the strategy to tackle a growing health crisis. Okay, so what is a shove? It's much more direct than a nudge. It's much more forceful than a nudge. Obviously, it's not as forceful as a smack. Um, but a shove, what it does is um, it's pretty explicit. And it's an explicit regulation of individuals' behaviours in a situation where the benefits of the individuals are perceived to outweigh the cost. So they believe that... Um, it has to be more forceful and they have to intervene because actually um, I suppose there's greater costs involved and they cannot just simply leave it to a nudge. So as we mentioned before about um, unhealthy foods and there's a real problem at the moment with regards to takeaways and uh, the overconsumption, especially from children and child obesity that it's causing. So there's many, and you saw in the video, there's there's a call for, for greater than just nudges. There has to be shoves, okay? Because what the argument is, is they have to actually remove that temptation. And by restricting uh, that choice, by banning takeaways near schools, then it, make, it makes it much harder to access it. So that means they won't be able to get it delivered. It means that they won't maybe access it from walking home from school. And it's just trying to uh, stop it from being so easy. Because as it says here in this article, and this is a BBC article, um, it's pretty obvious that if you make things easy, people will gravitate towards them. So what do you do? You try to make them not as easy. And sometimes a nudge will not do that. And a shove or a smack is needed. So it's all very well changing intentions. And uh, he's explained that there's a gap between people's intentions to eat healthy food, for example, and what they actually do. Reducing accessibility and removing temptation helps with that. Now, the reason why it's not a smack is because they're not completely banning takeaways. They're just restricting it from a certain distance from schools. So just to give you a bit of an example of what's happened in uh, London, so this area around Regent Park has few streets where new fast food outlets could be opened. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to restrict it. Now, there is that choice. Okay, well, when what should we do then? Should we do a nudge? Should we do a shove? And um, should we actually, should the state actually get involved or should we just completely leave it to individual choice? There is an argument that um, nudges... Um, why should people be nudged into the right decision? Do people not have their own um, state of mind? Can people not make their own decisions? And some people argue that it's actually quite patronising or condescending. Others will see the merit of nudges, especially if you think about that demographic of children with takeaways. They maybe they don't quite have the maturity to make certain decisions, and maybe those decisions are not always in their best interest. So a nudge can help with that. But there is also the argument, can nudges be used on a larger scale? And if so, can the improvements be sustained in the long term? Because nudging is much more subtle, sometimes it limits the effectiveness of um, what they're trying to achieve. So, for example, if we see that there is a market failure and we do see a problem with overconsumption of, for example, unhealthy foods, would a nudge be sufficient enough or would we actually have to be much more forceful in to try to solve and tackle that market failure? Some problems are just too big to be fixed. And, and a perfect example is of COVID. There was an article by The Guardian um, at the very, very beginning of the COVID outbreak when it was starting to uh, hit the UK. 
And we started to see um, what was happening in Italy and, and other countries. And people were saying, why are we not acting? Why is the government not being much uh, stricter? Whilst others didn't want the government to be strict. Now, there's an interesting article as to why Boris Johnson may have left it a little bit later. And what he believed was, actually, what we need to do to begin with is nudge the public into doing the right things. So that could be in terms of social distancing, uh, hygiene with washing your hands. Um, but he believed that if you if you were more forceful at that time, then anarchy would have been created. And the reason for that is, uh, and again, I'm not justifying it at all. This is nothing to do with my opinion. I'm just uh, pretty much relaying what was in the article. It said that they knew lockdown was going to happen. But if they locked down too early then there might have been more rebellion from the public and therefore nudging them to begin with and then moving up that spectrum that I showed you earlier, uh, they believed might have been uh, the most efficient way of doing so. You obviously have your own opinions of that.